Hello and welcome to our last lecture for the 2021 Fall CJS Thursday Lecture Series. My name is Christopher Dreyer. I'm the Acquiring Editor for Asian Studies at the University of Michigan Press and a proud partner with the CJS Publications Program. We'd like to particularly thank the Center Director, Shinobu Kitayama, and staff, uh, Robin, Barbara, Jillian, and Yuri, especially, for their tremendous work in preparing and coordinating all these events, especially during the pandemic. Before tonight's lecture, we have a few general announcements. Our winter 2022 lecture series will return Thursday, January 13th, 2022 at noon with Charles McLean, Toyota visiting professor at, here at the center, speaking on Too Young to Run, voter evaluations of the age of candidates. Uh, this lecture will mark our first in a hybrid format. So audience members can attend either in person at 1010 Weiser Hall here on campus or online via Zoom as you are currently doing. Uh, do note that it is noon Ann Arbor Eastern Standard Time. For more information about this event and many future programs scheduled in the series, please check out the CGS events page or the various social media as you prefer. For tonight, you'll note that the attendee webcams and microphones have been muted but we invite you to use the Q&A function, the buttons, buttons at the bottom, during the lecture to submit any questions you have. At the end, we'll try to address as many as possible. With that, I am honored to introduce today's speaker. Professor Bettina gramlich oka is Professor of Japanese History at the Faculty of Liberal Arts of Sofia University. Her research concentrates on the Tokugawa period with particular interests in the fields of gender, economic thought, medical history, and network studies. All of this comes to bear in tonight's lecture, which incorporates her recent co-edited volume, Women in Networks in 19th Century Japan, as well as the development of the Japan Biographical Database. Rather than me saying anything more on that, I will simply conclude by adding that she is currently the chief editor of Monumenta Nipponica, which is a journal that many attending tonight are likely familiar with. And so with that, I invite you to please virtually welcome Professor Graham Lakoka. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this very kind um, introduction. And let me actually right away share my screen with you. I hope you can see that well. Well, first, let me express my deep appreciation for being invited back to this wonderful lecture series of the Center for Japanese Studies at the University of Michigan. Um, it is my second time, so I'm very um, thrilled to be part again, even though this time it's remote, um, I won't be able to have cherry pie in Ann Arbor. But nonetheless, thank you so much. It is an honor to be here with you and special thanks, of course, goes out to those who made this happen. So Christopher, who just kindly introduced me, Barbara, Robin, Yuri and Jillian. And of course, last not least, the director of the center, Professor Kitayama. So thank you again. Um, for inviting me and thank you, um, the audience here on Zoom, who is going to um, listen to this talk. So I'm very excited. Thank you very much for joining me. So many of you must be actually glad that the winter break um, is about to begin. And in case that you're not still looking for a good book to read um, during the break, what about the edited volume? So. Yes, so I want to pitch, of course, also this little um, volume that came out last year in um, November 2020. Um, 20, uh, 2020. And um, you see the link now also in the chat. So please go, go ahead. There is lots of time for you over the break. And I'm sure this tiny little book here might be wonderful entertainment. Um, it was really a wonderful experience to publish with the University of Michigan Press. And um, I mean, wonderful designer, as you can see, the cover is stunning. Um, wonderful copy editors, typesetters, and of course, Christopher, who, who started this entire project. And um, the authors and editors of the volume are truly happy with the results. So I hope, of course, that the readers too um, will be happy with 
the result of the book. So I'm not going really to talk too much about the book, but I should just say a few words because it is related to the talk um, that I'm going to give later on. And much of it has to do with, which you see here with the outline challenges and prospects when studying networks of the Tokugawa period, right? So the volume includes 10 articles of which five are by Japanese authors um, who usually do not publish much in English. And so we were very proud that we were able to um, have wonderful translations of their research and making it now available to a larger audience. So that was one of the aims, of course, that we had. And so please, um, you know, just, just, just have a look and see, um, you know, what is in there for you. So to describe and examine women's networks of the past is extremely difficult. Record keeping was often done by men who did not bother to mention women. And they also wrote mainly in a homosocial context. And thus it is difficult to come to understand the networks among women or those networks in which women participated. Given this patriarchal bias of our sources that conceal most of women's activities for a study on women, um, and their networks, one has basically two choices, and those were pursued in the volume, either as suggested by Anna Behrens, who has worked intensively on prosopography for the Tokugawa period, um, one is to paradoxically study the men and work with materials that depict the context created by men within which women acted. And we have a few couples of these approaches in the volume. The other choice is to use materials written by women who describe their lives in terms of their relations to men. Women saw um, their social identity as defined mainly through that of their husbands, fathers, and sons, and by their domestic and reproductive roles, just as their productivity too, was measured in terms of man's work and the household economy. Here too, in the book, we have a few chapters where this kind of material has been utilized. And so we end up often dealing therefore with literate women and women from wealthy commoner or mid-ranking warrior background. This is just mainly the material that we end up with for the Tokugawa period. So despite their um, obvious limitations, both kinds of materials can offer details that allow us to reconstruct the diverse roles performed by women and their networks across time and space. I say performed, since they only wrote down what they considered to be worthwhile their ink. In some, the networks introduced in the volume show the possibilities offered by forms of human communication that do not figure in the sources left behind by men alone, or that may have been previously overlooked when reading men's records. And this point is important. What you will gain from the book is a heterogeneous picture and not one simple network pattern or a uniform type of networks particular to women. That this diversity indicates that not gender alone, but many other factors play into the individual's form of participation in networks. And this counts for women just as it does for men. And here the database comes in. The interest in these other factors, together with gender, and the goal to be able to make a comparison of the involvement in networks by a man and a woman is my point of departure. So let me now turn to the heart of today's talk. And here we go. So the current state of the um, project here, the Japan Biographical Database, maybe some of you have heard me talk about it in the past. Um, I have introduced it as a database to um, announce it at various conferences. And I also have, of course, repeatedly um, have health symposia here at Sofia University and so forth. I started thinking about the database in 2010 when I started working on this new um, research project about the Rai family in Hiroshima. Data input began in 2012 and in 2018 with the collaboration by the database designer of Harvard's China Biographical Database, Michael Fuller, who is at UC Irvine, 
led to a new frame. And that is the frame that we are currently using. Since then, of course, various improvements have been undertaken and also further developments. And what can be done right now with this database are two kinds of inquiries. One of them is um, questions related to social network analysis, and the other one is related to prosopography. And I'm going to show you both in a moment. But first, a few couple words about my research, um, because this is also, of course, more about me and what I have been doing, even though I'm not going to show you um, a great argument and I won't show you also a big conclusion. This is sort of a different type of talk. It's something about looking behind um, the historian's um, lab. What are we doing here? What are we trying to do in what I, you know, what is usually called digital history. So let's see what, what is um, that we are doing. So here, the database itself is large, and it can accommodate unlimited data, I think. So let me talk here only about my own personal research interest, the Dai family of Hiroshima during the Tokugawa period. I have already published a handful of articles on the family. One of them is also in the Women and um, Networks volume. And my interest here with this database and also my research in regard to the family is rather broad. The household is supposed to serve me as a showcase for scholars of the late Tokugawa period. It tells me about their daily lives, their kinship and non-kinship relations, how they earned their livelihood, about their careers, their travels, and of course, their scholarship. It tells me about illnesses in the family, natural disasters that they encountered, death and birth, rituals, meals, work. Um, a small universe is supposed to unfold itself. And for that, um, of course, I'm fortunate to have chosen, well, fortunate, I did it deliberately. I chose um, a family or a household that has substantial, um, a substantial volume of records. Um, and two of those substantial records are these two diaries, right, by a husband and wife. So we have two parallel diaries overlapping um, for at least like 35 years about it. And um, that is important because um, even though 10 years they lived apart, the other years they lived together on and off. So it is an interesting um, showcase, again, to see how two people in one household describe their lives and activities differently. Um, there are also more than 700 letters that were exchanged amongst them and their friends that are still available. Actually, the, um, the museum that is in charge of Rai Sanyo's um, archive, Rai Sanyo is their son and he's probably more famous to most of the people. They just came out with the catalog, a substantial catalog um, in print version that I received this year. And I look very much forward to work with um, that. Until then, we really did not know what was in the archive and what was not. So now it's much easier for scholars to um, get access to the information and then see what they would like to look up and go to Hiroshima. So um, what, what do we do with these diaries in particular? Because this is part of the network um, studies that I'm interested in. Um, since April, I asked um, my team to really concentrate their efforts only on the diaries themselves, going line by line through the diary and um, entering information drawn from that into the database. And since it is a relational database, and I'll show that to you more in a moment, um, important is that every event is locked. And events can be meetings, but it can be also correspondence. So we'll, we will look at it. And so as you see, since April, um, 3,365 3, lines from Shizu's diary, the wife's diary has been entered and um, from Shunsui's side it's 3013. So it's about, we have four people working on that. And so there is an overlap of about, well, at least, you know, maybe six or seven years um, that we can work with. Shunsui started this diary earlier. 
Um, and also his diary, even though it's much shorter, you can see it is substantial. He was a vivid record keeper. Um, and so who is entering and helping with that? Because it's of course not me who is doing most of the labor. <laughs> I shouldn't say of course, um, but um, it's a team. We are working here as a team and Leo Born at Heidelberg University, he is really in charge of the database. He is the designer, the programmer, the coder, the, the person who also thinks stuff through. Um, and makes it happen. And um, Asanu Yusuke has been as our team leader already for 10 years since I started coming up with this idea. And so we have others like Shimada-san and Furuichi-san and Shirayama-san are currently this year helping me out um, in the team to feed the database. It's wonderful that they all are willing to do it. It's a tedious job. Um, you have to work really with concentration. And of course it's often sorobun and it's not so easy also to find information about the, the people, but they do a wonderful job. And I really would like to thank them also now here publicly. And all of that of course is only hap um, happening with the funds. And I'm very fortunate that the Institute of Comparative Culture at Sofia University has been supporting this project since its beginning. So it's been now already for 11 years. And um, also, um, I'm lucky that I have a wonderful team of scholars here in Japan that always applies together for um, grants from the Japanese government. So this is already our sixth year again that we have money and we have new applications in for next year. And I also just started um, to have now this collaborative research project with the NIGEL um, out in touch cover, which is very exciting. So we will see what we can do together next um, academic year when it begins. So what is it actually um, that makes this database necessary? And you know, what is also so special about it? And here is one explanation. I mean, my frustration back then in 2010, when I started thinking about a database, which I only conceived of an Excel sheet, honestly, um, was that I wanted to know more about a person's life. Um, dictionaries and Japan knowledge is wonderful. I use it every day. It's a wonderful resource. Every day, new things are coming up. The Kamakura Ibunu now is included and, and, and. It's just wonderful to work with it. And, um, but it, it gives us only one tiny dimension of a person's life. And the focus, like in the English version, when you, I mean, Rai Shunsui and Rai Shisu are not even in the English version, of course, because they are not famous enough. Rai Sanyo is. But, um, you know, his, his mother is not mentioned. His two wives are not mentioned. And also, I mean, the information is really, of course, you know, for dictionaries, it's very short and brief and only what the author thought was relevant. The Japanese version in the Kokushi Daichiten um, is a little bit more substantial, but still, I mean, here at least the mother is mentioned, um, but also, of course, in relation to her father. And um, that is about it, right? I mean, we don't find out about so when and how and time and space. And those are the things that I'm interested in, trying to really to give these historical figures more of a 3D um, vision, seeing how they walked through life, um, through space and time, meeting people, um, you know, stopping to meet people, making new connections and what that meant to them, how intense were the connections and so forth. So the database is supposed to make a difference. And as you can see here, I mean, this is just a tiny glimpse to give you the idea of, yes, you can make, of course, with enough data, a big difference in the information that you can draw on. Um, writing a biography is certainly a wonderful way to do so as well, but the information again is written in text and it's two dimensional and it's not as flexible and as bendable as data in a database like this one, relational one. So here you can see to the left, um, only within five years, the people that Rai Sanyo um, has been 
in our database, only the data that we have entered from the diaries has been mentioned in relation to other people, basically meeting them or writing letters to them. Um, if you look at the data set that we have here in a long, longer term span from 82 to 1800, you see that there are quite a few more. Um, the different bubbles here is the division into gender. So this gives you just a small idea about why I think um, a database like the Japan Biographical one is um, necessary, at least for my research. But now let's let's go and look behind it and let me share with you um, the database as such. Let me quickly move over and I will now um, actually also stop my video because um, I want to make sure that we stay online. Let me make this just a little bit smaller. I hope you can see well the database here. It's in the frame. Um, it's bilingual. So this is our front page that will be renewed very soon. Um, there is some information about it. For instance, if you just want to know about the stats right now, how many persons have been entered. So at this point, we have 12,000 people um, entered. And as you can see here, most people are now in Meiji. And that's because of a new data set that we just have received. Um, but otherwise, I mean, the concentration is certainly in the Tokugawa period. Um, that is the period I'm interested in. So, but we also have data, you know, as we all the way back um, to pre Nada that comes from the Kokushi Daichi Ten, more or less. We have news and so forth. Um, okay, but let's enter. Let's enter the database so that I can show you a little bit how it looks like. I'm not logged in. So, this is. Um, available to you as well. Although I would ask you right now, maybe not to um, go to the database, please do so later because we wanna make sure that I can do all the visualizations um, without other people trying to do 20 visualizations at the same time. It should be stable enough, but um, just in case that it is not. So we have, um, of course, I mentioned 12,000 persons are entered and each person gets an ID and a card. And if you look, of course, my number one person is Rai Shunsui. That was the first person that we entered. Um, we try to give all kinds of information, names, date of birth, other names. And so this is now the English program. Otherwise, it would say go and so forth. We have, um, as I said, it's bilingual also when you enter it. Um, death of birth. And of course, the GIS map is crucial to us. And I will introduce that later. We also say, of course, from which um, sources we gather information about him. Um, we have here little links so that you can go over to other, um, you know, where you can find has this person, for instance, written up any texts that are currently kept in archives. So you can go over to the Kokobunken and you will find out, oh yeah, he actually is an author and has um, works that you can look at. And then you can also, my, my newest one that I'm very excited about, and I don't know whether you, you Wikipedia of course is there too, Japan Search, probably everyone knows about this in this crowd here. Um, this is the newest thing that I love to play with. The beta version was until last year, but now they have the full version out here and it includes, you know, it's from the Kokai Toshikan, I think. Um, and they include many other databases and information about it. So here again, if you wanna know something about an author, I mean, it's a wonderful tool. And I really <laughs> enjoy, um, you know, playing with that and finding out information though. Honestly, um, in my work here also as an editor, I use it quite a bit to find out about, you know, if persons are mentioned, what else do we know about the person? You know, how, especially during times of Corona where now researchers from foreign countries cannot easily come or right now actually cannot come to Japan, um, at least the digitization um, of many of these archival documents has increased a lot. So at least you can search for those and find them online. 
We also give um, personal history so that at one point that you can also have a trajectory of a person's life on a map, but this is still um, an early stage. So we started only to, to show when he, you know, his income increased and um, some of the, the key moments. We have his kinship relations um, also dotted so that you already have connections in my relational database. Um, we also have non-kinship relations. Most of them, of course, are friends that show up in his diaries and his letters or students, disciples, teachers, and so forth. And most important, of course, for my um, social network analysis are these events. So for Rai Shunsui alone, we have 7,283 events locked, meaning um, we have here that many meetings that he participated in, sometimes only him and another person, um, sometimes also, you know, three people and so forth. Um, exchanges are usually letters, correspondence, but also gift exchanges or people. Um, I did not mention that earlier, but we have a couple of projects already included here in the database. And this is why we are going to renew all, also our homepage to have um, individual um, pages for each project where these researchers can introduce what they're doing. So we have here one project integrated is the slave trade in East Asia in the 15th and 16th century, no, 16th and early 17th century, I think. And um, so there will be then a, a clear distinction that you can see, okay, these data in here. And then of course, for exchange types, um, we would be talking here about um, selling and buying of people as well. Anyway, so this is the, the basic information that we enter for a person, but let us move on to visualizations, which makes it, um, you know, really just more exciting to look at. Okay, and I will do actually a parallel one. And I'm not so quite sure if you can see that. No, you cannot, right? So I will have to change the setting so that we can have two of them at the at the one time okay all right so let us start looking at Dai Shunzi in his um diary the events that we have logged no distinction here just by gender for fun um, visualize the intensity of the connections, add, of course, the time slider, because then it becomes more fun, and limit it only to this one source. And I will do so in a moment also um, for, let me go over, while the other one is loading, let me also do the same for Shizu, so that we can have a comparison. Okay, no, I have to start it over from the beginning. Okay, anyway, so while the other thing is loading, I hope it doesn't go too slowly, but it should be fine. Okay, so Rai Shunsui, certainly he's my main guy. And as you can see, um, of course, there's a lot of things going on. There are 80, 831 nodes, meaning there are 831 people that we have locked between 1781 and 1803. So those are the people that he had some contact with um, from, that's from the readings of the diary. We have 2060 edges, meaning connections, right? Events that were locked. Um, in, indicating that some of them were more intense than others. We have also here a single group that is not even connected to Rai Shunsui himself, who is in the center, meaning that he must have described an event taking place between two people that he was not part of. So that would be outside. Now, the animation is important because here we can see how, um, in the diary, you know, people show up. It doesn't mean that he has not known these people prior 
to writing it down. But this is the first time they do show up in the, in the diary. So it's a new connection to us. We have to begin somewhere. And you also need to keep in mind that, of course, all of these visualizations are not reflecting a reality of Shunzi's actual life, but only what he thought was important for him to write it down. So these are the connections that he considered to be important and um, valuable. Okay, and let me do, so here you, you see how it slowly and surely moves on. At the same time, let me do the same for Shizu. So that you can see, how does that look now when you go to her diary, where we have this clear overlap, right, between one and the other person. And um, hers is smaller. So we see only 255 people so far. I mean, keep in mind, um, our diary entries, um, the overlap is at this point only about nine years, right, that we have. Um, even though it says here 832, we have some select single um, entries already locked in the database, but the main bulk is really in the first um, nine years only. So keep this in mind. So hers looks different. And in particular, when you, you look also at um, various little ones, you can start here also the animation process. Of course, you can see how is, hers is much faster, right? She does not have that many people that she is connected with. We see how Shun Sui and Shisu have a very strong connection um, throughout actually. She has been mentioning him a lot, meeting people with him in their household um, that she records. That's an important point. So here you can see the intensity um, because this edge is much thicker and that's why you have um, also um, all these meetings that you can check. So we have 425 and let me actually go to, back to that in a moment. Let's see what he's doing. So we, let's stop this for a moment, show again the entire one. Oh, no, I did, did not want to. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're running two visualizations at once with Zoom is a little tricky. What else can we do here? I mean, you can go, of course, and look up who is this person, right? So you would find information here. You can show the person in the graph, but you can also go back to the database and get information about the person, although we don't know much about him, right? This Kiyokawa Gendo. Um, and you can see, all right, here there is a connection with someone else. Um, other people, then we have two colors, one of them is male and the other is female, and we see the red is overwhelmingly the majority, so all of these are men. So we get information here, we get, as I said, if you click onto the edges, you get information about the meetings and what took place. You can go and filter more by looking, for instance, in his network, the sh show the person's distribution by gender. So we see um, that 814 versus um, six female are mentioned in his diary of people that he met or you know, you know any type of event that took place. When it comes to status, we see most of them, we just simply don't know of what kind of state. We have just the name in the diary. So that will be, of course, more work um, in the archives to go in then and try to find out, you know, that is in Hiroshima. So who are these people? And there are a few lists, of course, of retainers that we can get a hold of. So that will be an extra part, of course, of the investigation to figure out who are these names and filling in more information about the individuals. We see also that 190 of them are actually warriors, which makes sense because Rai Shunsui became a domain scholar in 1781. That's why he moved from Osaka to Hiroshima. So of course, the more context you know, the more you also will be able to work with the database and bring meaning to what you see. We also divide it up not only by status, because status alone does not 
usually suffice in giving us information. We also looked into occupations, if we know something about them. And of course, unknown is the largest group, but scholars, of course, there are 36 of them and also 21 physicians. Well, the physician ones is a tricky one. Many of the scholars were also physicians, but we also know that Shunsu in his household, of course, they needed physicians, doctors to come in almost daily. So we have here um, something coming together. Now, let us compare this um, with Shisu and her networks. So we see right away that the gender distribution must be different. And yes, it is. Well, Shunzi only mentioned six out of 800. We have here 57 women um, versus 167 men being mentioned. So we see, yes, so she, she certainly um, describes here also, she writes down names of women that she encountered that came to the household that were maybe even female servants, um, female relatives that find space in her record keeping versus they do not find space in Shunsu's record keeping, even though they share the same household. Um, of course, then here we have very similar um, distributions in terms of status and also in terms of occupation. I mean, gender, I think, is here quite telling and in interesting. Event distributions, we can also then subdivide up. Most of them are actual meetings, um, but there are also many exchanges. Both of them, husband and wife, were really um, letter writers on a daily basis. Um, that's why we have more than 700 right now extend. We can do the same also for him. We can, um, another thing that I wanted to show you, which is sort of interesting is if you take, how did I do that? Okay, Shunsui and Shisu, if you take, um, yeah. I need just one example. Let me pull him out. Uh, maybe Shisu first because it's easier. Okay, so we have here the relations, right? How many, how often are in the same time period um, Shisu mentions having meetings with her husband and others. I mean, as you can see the number of people participating, it's not just the two of them, but she mentions that she participated and um, her husband was there and other people as well, 425 of them. Now, if we go over to Shunsui and let me actually find Shisu. It's, she's really difficult to find. Um, there was a way of how to look for her. Shisu. No, it's probably in Shisu. Oh, I shouldn't type it in this way. Okay, here. Okay, so if we have her and zoom out again a little bit. Okay, so Rai Shisu and Shunsui in Shunsui's diary has only 107 events. So he really does not lock as many um, common meetings where his wife is present. So we see really that while she um, makes a big point of it to record the um, meetings in the household that involved um, her husband, he does not so um, when it involves, involves Shisu. So we may have been able to assume that from the beginning that yes, you know, men write in homosocial context and only in that. Um, Shisu, she does that as well. She actually writes the records of, mainly for the household and for the male successors of the household, but she still um, mentions also women um, that she encounters. 
because she has, of course, to deal um, with many of the daughters-in-laws that will come in with the mothers-in-law and other female relatives. But um, while Shunzui also met all these people in his household, he just did not um, really bother to point this out. Okay, there's another thing that we can do. And um, let's go to another type of visualization. So this is basically just showing um, a person's network, the development and integration in a network. And so we have seen how Shizu and Shunzu were involved in it. Um, they can be center or not center, depending on. Um, but we can also do something else. And let's look, for instance, into kinship relationships um, that we can show if you're just interested in that. And then those of you who are familiar with pre-modern Japanese kinship relations, they know it's actually almost impossible to show that in a graph. I mean, we still tend to make these beautiful family trees and for the women and networks volume, um, we needed a full page to somehow show all these different types of connections um, between one and another. But it is tricky. And it is not, not an easy feat. And I'm a little bit concerned of why this is taking so long, but let, let us hope it comes out quickly. Maybe if I take this off. Or did I push something? No, I think I did it all right. But it shouldn't take that long. Let me tr retry it just to make sure. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, this was a little bit what I was worried about, that maybe with Zoom, sometimes it might be difficult to show all of that. It should come back. Let us hope. Do not think. Uh, well, one second. Okay, so anyway, so kinships. Yes, we want to do something new. Okay. We wanted to do Shisu again from her diary. Although we don't need, to, uh, maybe if we just don't do it, if we just go to the person's name. Um, I'm still learning really of how to, to use my, my database here, um, but it's lots of fun. So we have, he, we have her, we wanna have kinship relationships. And so let's see, maybe this works faster. Um, Hopefully. Oh, I see something to develop. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's, it's hard, it's difficult to show that. And that is one of the things that we are still trying to figure out how to work with kinship relationships. Um, first of all, we have here like three or four layers. So the top one would be grandfather, current generation, and then generations below. But of course, they don't fit. Here, actually, it's not correct. Um, and the reason is, Adoption, yes, adoption takes place in the Rai family a lot, and that causes problems because there are generational problems. Shun Sui adopts his grandson as his son, and he adopts his nephew as his son. So in that moment, of course, everything here falls apart. But what we can do is we can um, actually manually go about and modify the settings. Oops. And where is my little box where you can do that? Um, you can move up and down, and I don't see my box, it must have disappeared, um, where you can, where you know exactly where they belong to. Um, Rai Shizu is on the perfect um, spot. Raiko, on the other hand, has to go up. So you can manually um, change the generation. And here you see, of course, all their connections. And it's these connections, um, and usually the first entry that dom you know, decides 
um, where the location of the person is in your genealogy, in your family tree here. So lots of things have to be done in the Rai family because adoption takes constantly place. Um, some of them, of course, have many wives. Rai Shunsui and Shisu, that was the only couple. Shunsui died before Shisu. Shisu did not remarry, and she also was the first wife. But Sanyo had two wives and his son Itsuan, who became the successor of the Rai household, he had at least four wives and um, many offspring. So that of course is an issue, but we try to indicate um, at least in these um, edges that you know, okay, who is who with an arrow so that it's very clear, the brother off and so forth. Um, you can pull them out and do, you know, at least do that. And you can also show the shortest path between, between one person and another. So kinship relationships are tricky. Now with non-kinship relations, um, let's see for this one. Um, here too, of course, you know, there are various ways of how to go about. We have to move this entire thing over. If you shrink it, you won't be able really to see it, but you will get sort of an overview of here are these peoples that are mentioned. Not too many women are in here. And um, then again, you know, who are these in these non kinship relationships, you can look at them, some of them, if they're above, then they would be um, someone who is um, here, you can see he's the teacher of Shun Sui, and then Shun Sui, he is the master of someone else. So here we can see the different types of um, relationships included if the data are entered correctly. Okay, so this, these are the, this, all these visualizations that you can do according to a person. But um, what if you want to do something very different? Um, you want to do prosopography, right? That is one of the things that I mentioned. And here we received this huge data set about Japanese students um, in the Meiji period studying at German universities and higher educational institutions. And um, there is no events actually, we have just do that and only in this source. Unfortunately, we only have the raw data at this point, just the names and nothing yet. Um, a few dates, but not where they stayed in Germany, but university, not, not, nothing of that. But what you can do at this point is at least um, show what are the commonalities, ideally. You would enter data about each person of, okay, where did they study? From when to when did they study at a university? What fields did they study? And then ideally, once these data are entered, which they are not, um, then you can show distributions. You can do these clusters. You can show, you know, what is, what is that? that combines them. You can cluster them by um, physician if you would have the information. And then you get here a cluster and the cluster would show actually only one person. <laughs> um, so information is still missing, but this is the type of um, prosopography that you can also do if you're not interested in um, actual relations between people and you know what I'm I'm interested in in my small research at this point, but then you know taking groups of people that are unrelated and try to do this type of um, research as well. The GIS now is the last thing that I can show you. And let me see if we have actually information about that. Let's go again. Um, only with Shunsu Nikki. Um, and yeah, let's just see what happens. So we have here from StreetMap, um, oh, Mapbox, it is OpenStreetMap. Yes, we have the maps and ideally, I mean, this was my first um, ideal when I thought about a database, I wanted to see people walking through space and time, right? And that is of course GIS. And um, so we are still working on this. And of course, if your data are not put in with all that type of information, then 
you know, there is, then you can't do it. But we do have now at least the technology to do so. So we have here 79 thing. And of course that is in Hiroshima. You can click on the events. So you know here what is happening, you know where, what kind of event um, connected to him, all these things that happening. This is his Lord, Shiga Akira. You have um, making and receiving a call. So this is all kind of cute, but later on you see, oh, he is traveling, right? He is moving, yes. And he is actually going to Edo. So you can follow him first on his path and you can see, so whom is he meeting on his way, right? So you can do all these kind of little um, information that takes it also onto a map and not only in a narrative that you know, okay, there is an event, they met in Ono no Michi or they met in Edo, um, but actually you can also show this graphically here by going on. He met, of course, tons of people in Osaka um, because he used to live there. That's where he came out and made a career in the first place. Um, Kimura Kenkado and all these famous scholars and Bunjin that he was connected to when he goes through Osaka, he always makes an effort to meet them. Once he is in Edo, I mean, that's when he really starts you know, connecting to people. Um, he really tries to, to reach out and mention, you know, tons of people that he constantly sees on a daily basis. And that's why his diary is so rich because it tells us who was in Edo at the time. So ideally in the future, we will be able to have various diaries um, integrated in the database um, many of his friends wrote diaries too because they had the same type of academic um, ambitions of, you know, about education and how to lead a scholarly life in the Edo period. And so record keeping was, of course, one of their tasks. And ideally, we will be able to see all these people, you know, streaming into to Edo at a certain time, they getting together for meetings. And then we see how some policies changed either in, in schools, domain schools, or at the Bakufu school, or even in the Bakufu itself. Uh, most of his friends are all living through an exciting time with him, where changes occurred, um, not only in intellectual history, but also in cultural history and in economic history. So these are the things that I'm um, really very much interested in, in showcasing. And by doing so, um, I, I was able to gain um, a, a much broader perspective on, on the time and also new questions that I was able to develop. So let me actually go back to my um, PowerPoint before I end here my talk. And so as you see, I mean, there are really differences that can already be told after entering only a few years. Um, out of the 35 years that we will be able to enter that match both diaries, um, you know, on a daily basis, out of those eight years only, we see already certain things that are different. Um, even though, again, I'm not claiming that any of them is a reality that they live through, they may still have, of course, not written down everything that occurred on those days. And that really doesn't matter to me that much yet. I mean, there are so many other records that I can draw on to fill out some, some more of the information, but it gives me ideas. It gives me ideas to think ahead. Um, we also see, of course, how women um, really write mostly in this male content um, and context. They write for them, they keep records for them. And um, even though they mention more, more other relations as well, we can see how it is certainly slided over to this type of masculine or male of, um, record keeping that we encounter. So what are my next goals? Um, in our project here. So I, I really um, try to, to that from next academic year, which starts in April, even having more people join the team to enter more information from the diaries and the letters and just filling out really these 
this the space of around these this entire household and trying to, to figure out who are these people where we still have to say unknown unknown we just have a name but we don't know where are they from what kind of um, profession what kind of status what kind of family relationships and so forth so hopefully we will be able over the next few years to get more um, into the database so that we can work with that and also you know explore more um, you know, ideas, writing up, of course, also a few few articles, hopefully on the way. And at one point, really trying to think for me as a historian who has been worked very traditionally and conservatively in writing, you know, articles, papers, and so forth. How can I integrate now um, something like this, the digital history? How can I do that in, in publications? It's one of the goals, of course, in the future to think about if I have, again, only static um, graphs and tables, and uh, then I'm, I'm not quite sure that I, I succeeded with the goal. Um, so those are the things that uh, hopefully the future will tell me um, how to go about. Then also, of course, um, one other goal is to make, as you, you um, will have noted, I was not locked into the database. So even you can exactly... Um, do the same steps that I just did. So I was not part of the administrative side of the database, but the one that is open access right now. You can do all these visualizations. There's a little booklet on the right side, an icon that is a manual that is for those who feed the database, but also for those who would just simply like to visualize some of it. If you encounter that certain peoples are not integrated, then it's not because... Um, you know, the, that it's just simply that we don't have data about them. So you cannot assume that our database is complete. Oh, it's far away from that. So many people are still missing, but unless someone feeds it, um, we won't have it. Um, yeah, text mining, of course, comes up to mind that this integration, there's, there's so many huge developments now here in Japan about um, not only text mining, but also text recognition, Mevo project and so forth. Um, hopefully then maybe it will be easier to feed the database also in the future with information, which right now is manually um, for various reasons, because I just also want to make sure that, you know, we have it already right. And, um, but there are other diaries that are much easier to handle that are reasonably printed and text recognition will be easier to um, succeed in that regard. The print version of the di um, diaries is old and um, thus also does not lend itself easily for that type of um, text mining. Anyway, so with these ideas, um, yes, we invite, of course, other projects that they approach us. They might have ideas. They would like to be integrated. Um, they can be completely separated. You can separate them out from the main database. You can integrate them as well. You have many options. Um, this database is not supposed to be our team's own little tiny pet project no it's supposed to serve actually others and hopefully it will in the future so we are trying now to do our little thing but um, others are doing theirs at the same time currently and maybe some of you here in the audience got intrigued and if you want to reach out to us please do so by all means and with that I will stop now and it took me a while. thank you very much um, again for listening and um, being here with me throughout and listen patiently for, um, in particular. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, now is the time for questions. So if you have any questions, again, the Q&A feature is the way to supply those. And we have some opening questions from Shinobu. Um, a few questions, one of which I think you answered already. Uh, this database is fascinating. It very much is. Um, I would like to know what substantive questions one can ask about Japanese history by using this database. Uh, I wonder if you might give us a few example of projects using this database. The projects you talked a bit more, but specifically the questions that you can see being addressed by this database. Right. I mean, 
if you so it depends on what you want to do so for the social network analysis i think i've shown more or less the the options that you have that you can really bring alive a group of people and their activities together and um how they they um you know, let their daily lives even, you know, what are the, the things that we often miss out when, when you do, for instance, intellectual history, you only work with treatises. I mean, those are dead texts in a way where people have great thoughts and ideas. And from these thoughts and ideas, um, scholars have tended to consider um, certain ideas as being part of a certain school. And with this participation in a certain school, you come to the idea, okay, um, there are schools that are with scholars that are really close to each other. And then there are others who do not agree at all with these ideas. And they must be also very, you know, in, 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 in strife with each other and conflict and maybe they don't even know each other or would not meet each other to have conversations and I think the database can show what has been part of a recent trend in research that um, actually you know doing this this very strict classification into intellectual schools does really not help us um, we know that many scholars even if they had different views and we do that even in the 21st century um, we might have different views about certain things but nonetheless we might be friends we might respect each other we might um, have tons of, of um, conversations just because we have different perspectives so you know, breaking down some of the um, walls and barriers that we created in modern scholarship, I think, um, by looking really more into these, these tiny little details that are easily overlooked and dictionaries usually don't mention it. They say, oh yeah, that was a student of this and this teacher. And you know, that's why that person belongs to the school. But maybe at the same time, um, he was, constantly in touch with someone else from a completely different school. Um, so these are, I think, some of the things for intellectual history that helps us. For economic history, I would think, um, because of these events, because they talk about certain issues, we can find from the database also, you know, what were the issues that they were talking about? Um, you know, where they're talking about um, the stipends being again reduced. So we find, you know, we can we can see what happens with the, the climate at the time. We can do all kinds of analysis um, stemming also, you know, what are these people doing? Why are so many people dying at one point, right? <laughs> they all have the same day when they died. And then you can look, oh, there was a big famine or there was a pandemic going around, um, whether smallpox or whatever it was. So I think the possibilities are really large um, just to look into how people live their lives together and how far was their um, horizon. Um, in particular, I think when you looked at the gender perspective that um, for these women that I mainly concentrate on, which are the highly literate women, um, and thus usually from warrior households, they are also a little bit more confined to the house, right? They are not so free to travel as much as, for instance, commoner women may have been. And um, at least when they are young and they're raising children and so forth, and their husbands are on duty away in Edo, but we also find out how they actually reach out to people very far away, that they have friends and acquaintances in other parts of Japan that they keep up um, you know, correspondence with, um, letters being exchanged every week. There was actually a symposium last year um, here in Japan where they were talking about this, you know, the changes that we encountered with living with COVID-19 and how people started reaching out. And of course we have Zoom now, right? I mean, I did not know Zoom before COVID-19 and all of a sudden from Tokyo, I can Zoom in. I have many Zoomies here around me. I love that, um, how convenient it became. But in the Edo period too, people reached out. They wrote letters constantly. They, you didn't have to have an ep epidemic in order to make these connections. And I can show that, I can visualize these. Now, if you're more interested in sociological questions um, and there's prosopography probably important. If you put in data, as I said, a set of students Japanese students who studied in, in, 
in Germany at the same time, and you just want to say something about them. What is their family background? Is it the same? Um, you know, did they all have stipends? Um, what was the career afterwards? Right. So you can you can look at a, a, a very clearly defined group by putting in data first and then draw it out. And I think um, in the social sciences, of course, people have been working with these kinds of relational databases and also prosopographical um, databases for, for many dec decades by now. And I think for historians also now to, to reach out and to do that. And the political sciences, of course, too, right? And you do it in biology as well. There's all these things that you can do. Um, so I think there are no limitations, I think, of ideas that you can come up with. Um, I might, my mind might be a little bit more limited in what I can do, but I'm very sure that you might have great ideas of what else you could do um, with this database. I hope I sort of answered this question. That actually feeds in specifically into the sort of the second part of the question that he had is I also wonder how you can assess the observations obtained from one family. So you talked a lot about focusing specifically on one family um, and how they are unique to this family or more generalizable in other ways. And I think in this case, you talked a lot about what other disciplines can do, but specifically for you in this case. Right. Oh, that's a wonderful question, too. So for me, as I said in the beginning, this, this is going to be a showcase, right? And um, I think I would like to come to understand better at first how a, a household that started off as um, with the status of commoners, um, that I family were not warriors from the beginning, how they started off as commoners, how they tried to make a living, how they tried to make a career, in particular Shun Sui, who was very ambitious, and how he then became a domain scholar and thereby he became a warrior. So his status changed, um, his occupation didn't change, he, continue to be a scholar, but now under, under very different circumstances and conditions. And also he's a very particular scholar. He's a Confucian scholar who considers certain things to be right. And his network is very important in integrating. So we have here a group of, I would say about 20 scholars, like-minded scholars um, during his lifetime that had very similar visions. And those are the people that I want to focus on to get an idea about this one group. And um, from there, ideally, I would spread over. So they cannot be representative for, for any um, scholar's household at all. I, I would not think so. I mean, they're actually very special because we have so many records and we still have a Rai family continuing and the tradition of being scholars. Um, the current Raiki, he just re retired, I guess, 15 years ago from Hiroshima University. So there is actually a, a tradition, a succession going on. Um, it is a very special showcase, certainly, and I, I will not try to generalize um, from that, but I certainly will be able to draw comparisons to other schools and scholars around that time where we also have um, materials available. It is more a micro um, cosmos that I'm going to create, but as we all know, right, microcosmos too can tell us a story and this type of story can answer some larger questions and that haven't been considered before. And for me, it is one way of how you know, every family member is integrated. So it's not just a man's show um, that often we encounter that, you know, these scholars are in the center of the narratives and the household is completely ignored. But without the household, um, certainly Shunzi would not have been able to achieve much. And the support came not only from this one single household, but also from other kinship relations and their households that supported them financially and so forth. So it's really just one very, very narrow one. But the database is not, I mean, I'm, I only showed you my data set in the database. So this is just for my own research, for my little own focus um, that I want to achieve to get a better understanding of what it meant to be a scholar in the late 18th, early 19th century. And 
you know, how you could make a career and actually quite a wealthy career on top of it and succeed also in changing school curricula and so forth. And, you know, making just a, a, a yeah, making a, a big, yeah, as a point on the map um, with my GIS maps for sure. And how women played a large role in it as well. So I think that is at this point that I can do. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, we certainly have time for more questions if anyone has anything on their mind that they would like to ask. Uh, while we're waiting for someone else to ask a question, I'm a little bit curious. We, we saw a little bit of the time it takes to load up some of the visualizations, but are there any other sort of unexpected difficulties or complexities that come with adding information to the database or just using it that sort of an opportunity to warn people before they get too far into it? No, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, that it's, if the data, if you have tons of data and Shunsu, you know, he's my main guy, we have tons of data on him. So the visualization takes time <laughs> or like this one group of 2,600 people, it just takes time until everyone is pulled out. Um, doing it on Zoom too slows it down a little. Um, otherwise, no, actually, most of the stuff, it's, it's really great. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm renting service space in Germany. And, um, it's, it's, it's very stable. It's wonderful. It's, they do great maintenance. Um, yeah, and it's, it's so far so good. The, the only hiccups are when I notice, oops, there's a type, you know, the typos are rare because most of them are radio buttons, whether it is status or profession or years and days and dates so that you can't make typos, you select them. So that is, that is good. Um, there is no, you know, those little things that we always do with type, typing something and making little mistakes. Um, but here and there, don't, that stuff that you have to do manually of course there can be typos and you know it, it can never be completely perfect and it will take time again and again so to you know to iron them out to notice them and and hopefully but otherwise um yeah no no the the visualizations are sort of I mean, there's so much more probably you can do, just as simply I can't do them yet. Right? So every time I talk to Leo, who is the programmer, you know, I said, oh, I did not know that. And, and he just said, really? I said, yes, I did not know that. It's sort of embarrassing, I know. And uh, I mean, he, he's patient with me. <laughs> I mean, he wrote the manual that I don't read. So yeah, I know, you know, some of us are not so good with manuals, right? I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure that's something you should invent. Oh, lecture. yes, 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 yes. Maybe, can you cut, can you cut this? edit it out we'll omit okay. that section <laughs> yes, 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 yes. yeah <laughs> no that it, it is very stable um just having tried to access it in a variety of circumstances it's I, even accessing it on zoom we it worked just fine we have another question uh actually from jillian who says thank you for the fascinating lecture and the visualizations I'm very interested in the primary documents you've been gathering this information from. Could you tell us a bit more about these sources, for example, where they housed and what circumstances led to their preservation over the last few centuries? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for this more historical question <laughs> of the research. Well, since Rai Sanyo is so famous in Japan, or, you know, he was celebrated um, throughout, well, until 1945. <laughs> um, he was celebrated very much, even though he is an Edo person who wrote also the famous Nihon Gaishi in the Edo period. Um, you know, the preservation of, of the materials around him and his family has been already, you know, started very, during his lifetime even. As I mentioned, Rai Shunsui, the father, um, he was a, a, a very, very much keen in preserving records. So all the letters that he wrote, he would say, well, after you read it, he would send it from Edo to Hiroshima and would say, well, after you read it, send it on to Takahara, where his um, house originally is from, and his brother would still live there. So in Takahara, um, most of these letters were preserved back then during the Edo period. And even to, until I think recently, they were still kept there. Um, 
in Hiroshima, there were some material kept, some part of the Rai family moved over to Tokyo. Um, one of them was a professor at the Ochanomisu um, University. So material he, he kept here in Tokyo as well. Um, I think 30 or 40 years ago, they opened in Hiroshima the Daisanyo um, Historical Museum where they archive basically, it's a small museum. They constantly have little um, exhibitions there, they have workshops there, um, they have reading groups there, they are quite active, and they are the ones who now compiled this catalog. So the diaries themselves are kept there in Hiroshima right now, as far as I know. I have never seen the original diaries. I mean, you cannot just walk in and um, see the materials, um, but they have been published in print version in, I think, the 1920s, um, when Dai Sanyo, you know, his, his entire collective um, works were published, and one volume of those seven or nine volumes are the two diaries by the husband and by father and mother. They are collected in there, so they were printed. There are a few problems with that, and scholars here in Japan have shown that, yes, there's also with the years, because they don't say what year one booklet was written. They just start on the first day of the first month, and sometimes you don't know. So the print version is not completely correct. Um, we do have also um, access to um, some copies of the original that we can also have a look at, but I've never seen the, the, the originals, but they are still there. And I, I think until two years ago, they had a reading group in Hiroshima where they would, um, not the entire um, diary by Shisu is actually reprint, is printed. And the few years that were not included in the 1920s volume, they started reading and transcribing um, and publishing locally in um, one of their newsletters. So we have been collecting those two. So having also the last years of Rai Shisu, um, because she, she really, you know, she lived a long fulfilled age and she traveled widely when she was um, a widow. She went to Kyoto for a few months to, to visit her son and then later she went back and so forth. So yes, so the materials are available. Um, much is published about Rai Shunsui as well. Um, Sanyo himself, when his father died, he published already in the Tokugawa period some of Shunsui's writings. And um, because it is a scholarly household, I mean, that, that process continued throughout. Um, so many, many things have been already published. All the Rai family members of the following generations have contributed to that effort to make um, letters available in print. So we have many smaller volumes that um, have reproduced letters between the brothers, um, some of um, Shizu as well. And so, the material is almost overwhelming if you want to, but you know, I, I have time, I'm, I'm not in a hurry. Um, and fortunately, I mean, there have been many Japanese scholars already working on them and have published some of the material, which makes it so much easier, of course, to get access to as well. Um, okay, I, I hope I sort of answered that question. There was also a Kenkyu Kai at Ochanomisu University with Oguji Yujiro Sensei who was working on Baishi or Shizu's pen name um, and they had a wonderful volume that came out describing everything about um, the gifts and presents that were handed um, to the family. So we have an Excel file of all that, you know, the, the commodities being exchanged. Um, there is someone who has investigated the dietary um, evidence we find in menus of um, rituals that were performed with food. So there are 800 of these menus preserved in the Rai family because as a Confucian scholar, he performed Confucian rituals. That's I'm very interested in. And these rituals, of course, go along with food and these menus, Shun Sui wrote them down and he probably made everyone in the household cook them for him. So we also know about that um, since in China, they use pork and all kinds of meat. Well, in Japan, 
they did not. So we find supplements for that in these rituals. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's amazing the, the kind of material. It's, it is exceptional, I know, it's, it's true. I, I, I chose that because I also know there is lots of material available. Hope that sort of answered. Did and, and more. Uh, we have a content question from Hatomi Tonomura. Uh, she says, Can you say something about the kinds of wives Rai Shunsui was getting as he was rising in social status? Do the sources tell you about the social hierarchy of the women in terms of his position? Let me see. Um, so, Sanyo, yeah, I mean, that is actually a, a wonderful thing about these um, women that we learn um, from the diary because Shizu was basically in charge um, of making all these connections to these other families where a woman would be taken into the household. And um, Shunzui was at that time often in Edo on duty. So it was her together with her brother-in-law, Shunzui's brother, who would do all these, you know, meeting for the first time and getting these women coming into the house. And we see certainly how the connections were um, made um, politically. So either the, um, these daughters come from fellow scholars' households in Hiroshima or retainers of the Hiroshima domain. So either or the matches were looked up, it's about same level. Um, none of them though, because it's in Hiroshima, you really see the educational gap. I mean, Shizu was exceptionally educated. She grew up in, in, in Osaka and she was a commoner's girl with lots of education where the father put also lots of effort into his daughters being highly educated. Her sister would marry of course, a very good friend of Rai Shunsui, Bito Chishu. And she also was highly educated and would move later to Edo. And, you know, they, they both were, of course, um, writing poetry a lot, writing each other's letters all the time, also playing music and so forth. So the, the considerations was often, first of all, to have links to scholars' households and also to warrior households. Warriors, of course, was a little bit different because a scholar's warrior status, um, you know, the, you had to have a successor who was not just male, but also had to be a scholar. <laughs> and that was, of course, the trouble that the family always encountered. You know, you cannot just have a male body fulfilling the function of the teacher in the domain school versus maybe with a retainer <laughs> as a guard. Uh, <clears throat> maybe it's fine just to have that with a male body filled. So there you have these issues going on that they also need to consider, you know, who is going to succeed and the levels and rankings that the Rai family being outsiders coming new to the house, uh, to Hiroshima and to the retainer house. Um, how do they fill in in these um, categories and, and Rai Shunsui's diary, the first couple of years when he learns to become a warrior, they are full of this anxiety of, oh, I need a sword and I need, I need the outfit. And when I go up to the castle, what do I have to do? So he always has these meetings that we know through my database the night before where he asks fellow retainers, okay, what is the protocol? And so he also would write down much of that. Um, just because it was all new to them. So, of course, not everyone would um, agree with the spouse that was chosen. And Shizu often actually disagreed <laughs> in the end with the girls, was not happy with them. Um, <clears throat> she lived with them and divorce happened quite a bit, especially, um, well, Sanyo, he left and um, she got along with his second wife. But um, the grandson who would become officially her son, I mean, he was married four times and sometimes the marriage lasted only a month and then three months and then she would write about them. Um, and I think I've written about that actually in the Women and Networks volume a little bit about it as well. Um, her opinions about them was not always too positive. And about her daughter, so her own daughter was married um, to a warrior, to a retainer of the Hiroshima. And she hardly really talks about him much. And um, she also di dies still young, so not, not too soon after 
they were married. And so that also ends there. I hope I sort of answered your question. Well, I think with that, if you had any sort of final thoughts or things you didn't get a chance to say in your presentation, uh, just to close up the evening. Well, one more time, thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for your patience, right? To, to stick here with me, going here through my visualizations. Hopefully you enjoyed them. Hopefully you have uh, more feedback for me. Um, please write me emails. And, you know, in Japan, we, we have our email addresses is all over the place. You will be easily <laughs> able to find it. Um, I, I wish, yeah, to hear from you. And hopefully at one point, I can meet also many of you in person. <laughs> again so thank you everyone again for joining me that's i guess all i, I would like to say and my ears already dropping down thank you so much especially on a night talking about networks uh, it, we all agree especially thanks to all the attendees who stayed through this it is a great privilege to be able to do these sorts of lectures, even if we aren't on site. <laughs>